Mr. Commissioner, uh, my name is John Small Schoenholtz. I'm Commission Counsel. Uh, I'd like to call Kevin McHale and Natalie Carey as the next witnesses. Bonjour. Hello. Mr. McGill, will you swear on a religious document or do you wish to affirm? Affirm. For the record, please state your full name and spell it out. Kevin McHale, K-E-V-I-N-M-C-H-A-L-E. -E. Do you solemnly affirm that the evidence to be given by you to this commission shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Ms. Carrier, will you swear on a religious document or do you wish to affirm? I wish to affirm. For the record, please state your full name and spell it out. Nathalie Carrier, N-A-T-H-A-L-I-E-R-C-A-R-R-I-E-R. Affirmez-vous solennellement que le témoignage que vous allez rendre va être comme you say that, the, that your testimony will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Thank you. I just want to clarify what testimony. Sorry. Sometimes I switch without knowing. <laughs> oh, we can accommodate that. Oui, merci. Uh, Allez-y. Go ahead. Merci. Um, Mr. McHale, Ms. Carrier, could you uh, please start by telling me your your uh, your title at work? I'm Natalie Carrier, Executive Director of the Vanny BIA, which is the Business Improvement Area. Kevin McHale, I'm the Executive Director of the Spark Street BIA and Mall Authority. Thank you. I like to pull up a a map just to help orient ourselves. If we could zoom in there. Okay, and let's go uh, close to where Parliament Hill is and we can zoom in. So, uh, Mr. Uh, McHale, uh, you see at the top right there of your screen is Parliament Hill, correct? Correct. And is Spark Street kind of the highlighted line there? Correct. That's the uh, five blocks of the pedestrian uh, promenade. Thank you. And if we could uh, zoom out, Ms. Curry, uh where does the Vaney BIA cover? Uh, it covers three main streets, Beechwood, Montreal Road, and MacArthur, from roughly the river to St. Laurent, with the exception of Beechwood that ends uh, when Havelock begins. And those are indicated here Correct. on the map? Correct. Thank you. And uh, did, you, uh, did you have any engagement with businesses outside of those three streets during, um, during the relevant period? Both um, Kevin and I sat on daily meetings, and we also uh, sit on the board of ACOBIA, which is the, con com the coalition of BIAs. So we do sometimes get communications from others. I have family and friends that own businesses on Bank Street, for example. And some of my businesses on Montreal Road or Beachwood would own other franchises and others. Okay. And uh, you're, uh, you're generally aware of the the parking lot at Coventry Road that was used by some of the uh, protesters? Generally aware. I would say intimately aware since January. Can uh, we just identify that on the screen, please? Um, that's right. And that uh, location that's been pinned uh, aligns with, uh, uh, sorry, the one on the left, please. That aligns with the, the parking lot that we're referring to? Uh, in essence, both parking lots were being used at one point, so both the Hampton okay. Inn one and the one that, per that belongs to the city. They're joined together, but there are two separate parking lots. And Ms. Carey, the, um, your BIA, as well as the Coventry road location, uh, would you describe that as being outside of the downtown core? Mm, it depends who you ask and what what's being done sometimes we're considered downtown because we have more urban issues um that are you know ho homelessness or um you know drug related issues things of that sort um but for the case of an event that happens downtown we would be considered slightly on the outskirts yes okay. and uh, were you liaising at all with any of the businesses on coventry road I was just by nature of being the closest BIA to them at one point because things were escalating and there was a lot of complaints being made. I did begin to liaise with a few businesses there. Thank you. We'll talk more about that later. Um, can you just quickly tell us what was your previous experience before joining the, uh, the Vanier BIA? 
I was the production manager for Ottawa 2017, so I did large-scale um, public events like La Machine, Crash Dice, Continuum Underground, and the pre, you know, pre to LRT being created, uh, Picnic on the Bridge, those kind of things. And I have that, 20 years experience in events. And, and did you have uh, experience in that role liaising with uh, the city and Ottawa police? I would say that would be more unofficially and anecdotally because of the knowledge that I carry with me. There are things that were brought to this table that were flagrant to me um, based on the knowledge that I have as uh, previously as a large scale event planner producer. And, and in referring to things that were flagrant, you're referring to events during the January and February. Correct. So okay. things that we saw that would be event like during the occupation or protests um, referred to my previous roles. Thank you. And my current roles. We do events at the BIA as well. Thank you. Um, so for both of you, could you just start by telling me what kind of information, if any, did you receive from the city and OPS in anticipation uh, of, of, the, uh, of the arrival of the convoy? I would say that we received very little information prior to. In fact, um, it was mostly um, the BIA in Byward that started requesting from our counselor. So to be clear, Councillor Fleury ha has three BIAs within his ward, Byward, Rideau, and Vanier. Um, and so Byward and Rideau had started getting increasingly aware of what was happening. We had been speaking with Bank Street and Spark Street uh, as a cobia, and they requested from Councillor Fleury to amass um, <clears throat> stakeholders so that we could better prepare for the weekend ahead. This was the week leading in, obviously, the week of the 27th, 28th. Thank you. Mr. McHale. Uh, yeah, I would say it was very minimal. Um, um, Spark Street experience, uh, experiences a number of activations and, and protests uh, and marches and such throughout the years because uh, of our proximity to the hill. Um, so the communication was quite minimal. I think it was only really we started to receive some because uh, some other BIAs and ACOBIA, which is the Ottawa Coalition of BIAs, um, started making direct requests as we were seeing this event starting to unfold to being bigger than what we typically experience in downtown Ottawa. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, I'd like to pull up coalition document. Um, oh, that's sorry, COA uh, 6060. We can just scroll down. So, uh, sorry, scroll back up. So this is the document uh, emailed dated January 27th. And if we scroll down, is this uh, one of the emails that would have been provided to the local BIAs? Yes. Okay. And um, was this kind of representative of the information the BIAs were receiving in anticipation of the arrival of the convoys? Uh, yes, um, the fact that we actually received it was kind of, I mean, to receive something again, because I think we were demanding some more um, uh, input and support as to what we uh, what we needed to inform our members of. Um, and uh, this is, again, the information provided isn't really any different than what we would receive for any other activation or any other um, event uh, in, the, in the downtown core space. So it really didn't... Um, meet what we kind of expected uh, from a, a level of robustness. And, uh, and what did you expect? Uh, we expected to see a bit of a game plan as to what uh, the actions were going to be to uh, deal with the massive vehicles that we were expecting at the downtown core, uh, perhaps similar to what we see during uh, um, when uh, road closures and such are put in place for an event like Canada Day. Uh, where vehicles aren't allowed in the core for the day and uh, barriers are, or city vehicles are used to uh, limit access to certain parts of the downtown core. So we really what we wanted to see was an action plan uh, of how uh, police and officials were going to uh, manage the uh, situation. And would you agree with that uh, testimony, Ms. Carey? I agree. I think we are looking for the plans that we normally get and receive or are shared with us leading into a Canada Day weekend or Winterlude or those kinds of things. So in this particular case, we were expecting 
Canada Day type closures. Um, and in, in the case of Vanier, that would only pertain to us as it pertains to any overflow traffic that often or sometimes gets directed to Coventry or would end up on Montreal Road or Rideau. Or... And did you request that type of information? Did you or anyone else in the, the business association community? We requested from the councillor to have a briefing with services, which we got. And when that briefing happened, we were surprised to see that that was not this posture that um, OPS and city were taking, meaning the lock, you know, the closing down of the streets and the downtown core to accommodate the level of what we were, I was seeing on social media was heading our way. What kind of information was provided during those briefings? To me, I, I, uh, again, specifically, uh, so uh, sorry uh, it, to clarify, ahead of the convoys arrived. Ahead of the convoy, it was a protest that was slightly unusual um, because of the nature of the the trucks. Right, normally when we have protests, it's, there's buses that arrive and drop off people, and and then an event happens and they get back on buses and leave. In this case, the the trucks were the protesters in in many ways. So there was some level that it was going to be complex because of the trucks. But for the most part, we were told, you know, by the end of the weekend, everything should be good and everyone will likely be gone. Okay. And would you agree with that, Mr. McKenna? Yeah, I would agree. Okay. And was that similar to the were you receiving information that was similar to what you'd received in other large-scale events, Ms. No. Curry? No. How did it differ? There was a lack of information for something that we deemed and I deemed having done large-scale events on that very particular space. You know, La Machine ran from Byward all the way to the museum and back. There was actually a Saturday night event that was here. We spent two years planning that because of the sheer level of people and, and the machines themselves were big. This was, uh, and so there was really no <laughs> information in our opinion, um, or, or, or there didn't seem to be, it, it, it didn't seem to be taken um, as seriously as other events. Thank you. Um, now, if we can, if you can take a look at paragraph four here on the screen, it says all open source information and in our interactions with Freedom Rally organizers indicate this will be a significant and extremely fluid event that could go on for a prolonged period. Um, did anyone during those briefings provide any explanation for what was meant by a uh, significant and extremely fluid event that could go on for a prolonged period? I think that there was an unpredictability about um, this event. There was reference to there being multiple organizers, um, but I don't think we were given much more, not to my knowledge. Mr. My McHale? Uh, no, I would, the feeling I have when I read a line like this, probably pre- uh, convoy uh, protest would be that this is just kind of an open-ended uh, protect yourself saying that, you know, if, if some of the organizers decide to stay, we don't know exactly. Um, uh, I mean, it's not uncommon to see this kind of language and thinking kind of an announcement like this, but again, our typical um, experience with other um, protests uh, in that, in the area are that people come, they protest uh, and they leave um, in, a, in a reasonable manner and, and where, um, at the time uh, when they say they will. And that was the impression you got from the communications from Ottawa Police Services? Uh, that's the feeling I had going into that weekend, yes, with the communication that we had received. Again, it seemed to be fairly low key from the, what we were receiving. Um, uh, my personal feeling was it was a little bit uh, similar to the farmers' protests that we had a number of years ago uh, here mm -hmm. in the Ottawa Corps, where uh, a group of farmers came through and brought in tractors and other heavy equipment. and were here for a day or so and, and then left. Um, so it was kind of my feeling of it was, um, again, having been on, having been on Spark Street for nine years and working in the core for 20, um, that this would be a loud, boisterous uh, weekend event and that by Monday morning, I'd be trying to figure out how to clean up my street, um, which wasn't the case. To clarify, was that your own assessment of the incoming convoy? Correct, yes, it's my own assessment. Again, that's, I, that's taking that assessment based upon the information we were provided. Right. Thank you. Um, did anyone during these meetings with uh, city and, and police officials 
ask why access to the downtown core was not being blocked. Ms. Carrier? Uh, I feel like at some point, all the BIAs there, there were five of us, did. Um, I remember my colleague, Kaylin from Byward, certainly, you know, um, making mention to why this wasn't happening or why couldn't we block streets like we do often for protests or events? Why couldn't we prevent access to our core? Um, there was no real answer um, to that. You don't remember any specific response to those I, questions? I remember Chief slowly saying publicly and not specifically to our daily briefings, but publicly saying things to the order of, "You, I can't stop trucks from driving in the city of Ottawa. I can't stop vehicles from driving in the city of Ottawa, which was baffling to me personally as an events person, because we had and we do often for events. Mr. McHale, do you recall any specific response to that question? Um, no, I, I, the response would be to what, to what Natalie alluded to, which is that basically they didn't have the rights to stop the vehicles from coming in. Did they provide information on, on why that was? Uh, no, nothing, nothing written. Thank you. Uh, who from the City of Ottawa was participating at these, uh, at these meetings, Ms. Carrier? Uh, it evolved. So in the beginning, it was... Uh, Basically, the three BIAs, we added in um, the three BIAs being Rito, Byward, and uh, Vanier. We added in Byward, uh, Bank Street and Sparks. Um, and there was bylaw traffic. So a, a, a series of city services, bylaw traffic, um, uh, police, OPS, our NRTs, which is our, our neighborhood resource team members, which is a police term for... Um, police that are dedicated to specific problematic areas, for lack of a better term, like Byward and Vanny um, and other areas. Uh, and, you know, uh, there was, I recall, a, it was evolving. So depending on the day, depending on what was happening, and as the situation was evolving, people would come in and out of these meetings daily based on availability or, I mean, there's certainly city management services um, Acobia was there, so Michelle, the executive director of Acobia. Um, Did the mayor of Ottawa or the city manager of Ottawa ever participate? I rem yeah, I don't know. I can't recall. If, I don't believe the mayor uh, participated in one of these calls. I believe uh, someone from his staff was on the call a couple times. Um, really on the political side, the, the call was driven by uh, Matt Fleury, uh, councillor uh, for Vanier. Um, and uh, he, he and his staff hosted the call every day and there'd be uh, mixing in. Councillor McKinney was on the call a couple times. Um, uh, who else? Um, uh, I remember Montforte, this. Yes. Oh, sorry, yeah. I'm so sorry, go ahead. No, no, um, uh, the, the MP for Vanier, uh, Montforte was on the call as well. Yeah. At Joel Harden was on the call. Later as well. in, when, when the occupation became the occupation and not a protest, the call of roughly 20 people was 70 people at times mm. daily. So there were MPPs, MPs that would join in on those calls. Um, but for the most part, the senior city person, in, to my recollection, was Kim Ayat, who was emergency services. So he was the person sort of speaking on behalf of fire, paramedics, and um, obviously police when police wasn't on the call. And did uh, sorry. No, finish your thought, please. I was going to say, oftentimes, the police representatives we had on the call are not people that I would consider senior OPS that I would have seen in other events. Did, uh, so did any of the senior OPS officials, uh, Chief, former Chief Slowly, uh, Deputies Bell and Ferguson, did they attend? I have a recollection of Chief Slowly joining um, the first week. So between the first and second weekends, there are... A, I don't recall what day exactly, but there was one call that he was on with us. Um, uh, yeah, he was on one or, one or two calls at the very beginning, and then as the situation continued, uh, uh, he was no longer on the call. Okay. And the deputies, did they attend? No, generally police representation was uh, Constable LeMay, who was uh, the community officer, okay. uh, was the primary police contact on the phone call. And there was, and I apologize, I do not remember her name, but I believe she was the deputy um, who came once or twice on the call as well. Ferguson? Yes. Uh, yes, Trish correct. Ferguson. Thank you. 
Um, and do you recall, so you say Chief Slowly attended once at that first week, so after the first weekend. Do you recall uh, you know, anything specific that he said during his attendance? Um, this is difficult because these are people we work with. These are people that we rely on. Um, I remember being scared personally. I'm sorry. Because I remember the chief saying at one point, you guys are scared, I get it. I'm scared too. And I thought, if the chief of police is scared, something much bigger is happening here than a protest. And that personally scared me. And I think a lot of us on that call were shaken. There was also a sense that week that things were starting to get shaken up. You know, there was instability. We, I sensed a sense of defensiveness. You know, everyone was caught off guard, I think. Everyone. I don't, I don't think any of us could have dreamed that this event that we, in our biggest thinking, would equate to Canada Day sort of, you know, the infractions that happen, the closures that happen, the people that come in, the disturbances it creates, the loud noise, the fireworks. None of us, I think, could have understood that that would actually get so much bigger. Um, so did you, did, did you each feel that the business community, the, the BIAs that you represent, that they got the information they needed to prepare for these events? No. 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 Despite us asking vehemently daily. Même si on... Information were you seeking that you did not receive? So there are things that pertain to businesses that are very specific in events like this, or, and I'm sorry, I keep calling it an event, that's my knowledge. So um, things like, will they have access to loading zones? How can deliveries happen? Can staff get in? Um, you know, where will the bus routes be? What, and because there was so much fluidity to what was happening, there was no sense that the plan today was going to be the next, the plan the next day. There was, you know, there was some fluidity to it, but mostly those are the things we needed to know. Can staff take OC Transpo and get from Vanier to their job at the Rideau Center? Will the Rideau Center be safe? Um, you know, those are the things that pertain to businesses. Like, can we have, can they have deliveries picked up and can they still do click and collect and can Uber Eats and skip the dishes get through? And, and to give context to it, though we're five kilometers away in Vanier from the downtown core, Uber Eats was not servicing. They were not servicing. So unlike what could be said to have happened to businesses during COVID, businesses were completely crippled. And that has to be understood by this commission because there were no deliveries. There was no loading zone. There was no Uber Eats. There was no clients in the stores. A lot of the, pro the protesters that arrived did support businesses. And I'm not gonna say that they didn't. They supported some businesses, but there was a lot of chaos. There was a lot of businesses that were deeply affected by protesters. And then there was this sense, there was, a lawlessness, if I can sp speak specifically to restaurants, which are often the most flexible of all of our businesses, right? They adapt very quickly. They can figure out things very quickly. But restaurants often had catering tables organized by protesters right outside their doors offering free hot dogs, free chocolates, free, you know, to everyone. Meanwhile, the business that was trying to stay open and survive was not getting any business. Thank you. I'd like to pull up uh, document COA6063. So the document we'll see here, Mr. McHale, is an exchange between you and, uh, and Councillor McKinney. Mm -hmm. uh, if we can scroll to the bottom, please. Uh, but yeah, further up. Okay, so I'll just l let you refresh your memory and read that exchange. So, Councillor McKenney is asking if you need any additional information, mm -hmm. and your response is, uh, and if we can go up just a tiny bit. So, on, on January 28th, so before the arrival of the convoy, you say, I think we are good, and then we continue. Uh, I'm, can you just help uh, maybe explain uh, to us what that meant in the context of, of what you were just communicating to me? 
Yeah, I, I think again, it, it comes down to having been on Spark Street for uh, for uh, over nine years now, and having a very veteran merchant mix. Um, there wasn't initially going into it necessarily a lot of concerns. So, um, I you know again having a bit more you know uh, dealing with protests and activation uh, through the core all the time. Again, I was as I said earlier, I felt that this was going to be large and boisterous, but not necessarily not obviously the three week uh, in, uh, event that it was. Um, so we 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 and again in Sparks here, we tend to be a little self sufficient. So we were very active uh, on social media, making sure we were getting information from uh, OPS and bylaw as we were directed to through comms, which was said the fastest way to get our information. Oftentimes was Twitter. Um, and uh, and so did Captain did reach out to make sure that we had got what we had. Um, and uh, so again, yeah, it was very much, uh, uh, I think we're good. The members are aware. Uh, again, my members go into the, an event like this, any other protest, um, not thinking about closing their doors, not really worried about, concerned about staff. Uh, an event, as we always say, I always say on Spark Street, um, people march up to Parliament Hill, uh, determined to get their message out, to tell people about what they need to be, uh, what they think that needs to be told. Um, uh, and say their piece, and then they uh, leave ha satisfied and happy that they've accomplished what they, they set out to do. Uh, and then they end up visiting our coffee shops and our, our restaurants, et cetera. Um, it was only kind of into Saturday night, Sunday, where we realized this was a different, um, there's a different energy in the crowd, if I can use that term. Um, and uh, that's when, again, a lot of my businesses who on the Saturday were open, uh, were trying to open, uh, regulations in Ontario, uh, we're starting to be lifted or they're being ready to lift, I believe on the Monday, on the 31st. Mm -hmm. um, and so our businesses were kind of actually getting ready for the province to be reopened and for, to welcome customers back inside their businesses uh, after a very long uh, uh, January or uh, yeah, January, December. Um, so again, I wasn't overly concerned at this one. It's, it's a very casual nature uh, to the conversation and, and uh, it's kind of how I, how I speak and how I flow. In uh, hindsight, were you prepared at that time? Um, in hindsight, yeah. I mean, as I, say, I was here, I, you know, I talked with staff um, along Spark Street. We have uh, uh, bollards um, that can be installed. Uh, we use them in the spring, summer, fall to control traffic. They're out right now uh, on the street if you're out there today. Um, wintertime, we have to remove them for snow operations. Um, so we had actually taken them out back in November, and so the street was open. Um, and again, it was at that point where the same time we're sitting here saying, okay, um, do you think we should put them in? You know, when we start seeing vehicles coming in, we didn't want them on the street for what we thought was just the weekend. Um, uh, so uh, my event uh, supervisor and I made the decision and we, you know, we had to dig out the, the holes and they're all full of snow and ice and, and uh, dig them out and vacuum them out. And we put the posts in uh, for the weekend. And uh, I think it was kind of a fortunate decision uh, for us to do that because I, I feel that the street would have ended up as, as kind of a, a secondary holding spot for vehicles and, and other activities. Did you consult OPS? Uh, yes, we had reached out to uh, Constable uh, Sean Kay, who we had a conversation with a couple months ago for another activation. Um, the constable's job is to liaise with uh, marches and, and uh, activations like that. So we'd reached out to Sean to say, do you think we should do that? Is it gonna interfere with operations? Again, having a knowledge of the street. Uh, in the past, when there have been activations or incidents, uh, Spark Street can sometimes become a holding spot for, um, uh, or just a cut through for police services or other um, entities, um, operations and such. Um, so we just we just did a reach out saying, hey, is this gonna interfere in any of your planning or any operations? And he said, no, uh, nothing. So just keep, just let us know when, we're, when it's done. So we did that. Uh, later at the beginning of the week, uh, I wanna say about February 3rd or so, we had to, we reached our second, second or third, uh, we reached back out to let them know we were taking them out. Uh, uh, they had done their job. They kept the vehicles off the street. Um, the feeling was there was two things happening then. I felt that the vehicles couldn't move anymore. They were kind of jammed into the spaces. Um, and uh, we had snow, snow falling. Uh, and so we had to pull them out so that snow clearing could happen. Uh, what ended up happening was uh, there was no snow operations for the next three weeks. So we had a nice layer of snow and ice on sparks for that, uh, for the remaining uh, convoy. So did you keep the ballers in for the whole period? We ended up having, we ended up removing them. And then what we realized from observing the, 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 the crowd, the vehicles and everyone around us and the way, uh, the way the groups were operating was that we felt sparks was okay without them. Uh, and at that point, cause we didn't think anything large could get in anymore. Uh, there was a lane for fire uh, and such, but that was about it. And that was being respected by everyone. So, uh, 
and it would have been again these are mechanical ball they're, they're not automated it's not a heat system it's uh, it's a pretty simple system um but by that time to get uh uh to put them back in was going to be very difficult after a snow event had you ever put these up for another uh protest before we had not uh, Ms. Carrier, I understand, uh, again, as, as you previously said, that you had some um, you liaised to a certain extent with the businesses on, on Coventry Road and visited that location. Mm. Is that correct? Correct. Um, and why was Coventry kind of a significant location in um, these events? Because the businesses were right next door to the encampment. So to put it in context, there is... Uh, a hotel, a parking lot for the hotel, a parking lot for the stadium, the stadium, and then there's a um, uh, Canadian Tire Best Buy and a, and a uh, Starbucks that are right there. There's also um, just at the corner of Lola, there's a veterinarian, an emergency hospital for um, animals, and uh, and also one of our organizations that we liaise with a lot, the Minwash and Lodge, is there as well. So there's organizations that are racialized that are in and around that area. So in my expertise as being a business relations person, um, I started just checking in on them to see if they were okay. How frequently did you uh, go visit that location physically? Uh, usually once a weekend. The weekends were definitely the worst, um, but Canadian Tire, we, I must have spoken to them five or six times, um, different people at each time. Sometimes it was the person, the customer service person, sometimes it was a manager on duty or another. Um, the Starbucks, I would, be going in to get a coffee because I spent a lot of time at Coventry and anecdotally I would ask questions and spoke to the manager once I think. Okay. Um, so what um, what did the manager or other personnel from Canadian Tire report to you throughout this period and maybe try and identify at right. which time? So in the beginning it was you know they were selling a lot of stuff they were selling gas tanks and they were selling rope and you know all the type of things that I think you would buy if you were camping out. Um, uh, and they also reported that uh, large groups of protesters, you know, by large, I probably mean three to 10, uh, would come in at once and then do the sort of thing that was, you know, that is now sort of cliche, but would go up to the workers with masks on and say, why do you wear masks? Why are you doing this? They would disrupt the sort of general, um, you know, the, the store, they would disrupt the store. And there was also um, evidence or evidence, not evidence, sorry, there was uh, things that were related to me that they, the protesters had been putting up posters throughout the store that looked like um, public health posters, but saying things like masks are stupid or masks aren't needed or, you know, so counterintuitive sort of things that staff, nothing, you know, violent, but definitely disruptive. The most, uh, the most terrifying call I had was on the last, the third weekend, where the manager was talking to me and he said, you know, Natalie, I don't know if this is something, but I feel like I should tell you, we've sold out of knives and bear spray this weekend. And that is something that I reported immediately to OPS. Thank you. Um, did you, were, did, did the Starbucks location and their manager report anything to you? Just disruptions, you know, there's a lot of LGBT people that work in OPS and sorry, in Starbucks and OPS as well, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, but, you know, there was a general feeling of annoyance. You know, it was it was an annoying thing. It was, you know, um, it was fine, but it wasn't, you know, the pleasant sort of, you know, there's some some protesters were perfectly pleasant and lovely. You know, that should be said. They're not all homogenous, right? But there were definitely the ones that would make comments about why they'd be wearing mask in a window and the door would be, you know, the window's open, you don't need a mask, those types of things. And, and again, I think we have to put this back into context of the first weekend being our stores were still closed. You couldn't go into a restaurant the, that first weekend. That was reopening on the 31st. So the, you know, the feeling that we have about masks today really has to be brought back to how weird that felt then. Um, I understand that you also visited the the Coventry Road parking lot where the that the protesters were using this during this period, correct? Several times, yes. Okay, and you took some videos. I sure did. I'll show a few to you. Um, so if we can pull up C O M five zero seven four four, if you could tell me when this was taken and where. Uh, I believe the Hampton Inn. I'm going to say Sunday night of the protest. Sunday night of the first weekend. Just doing a little recon mission here. 
see what's Sorry. going on in our neighborhood right now. It's very embarrassing. <laughs> sure it has to be said. Get in or out. Doesn't look like it. It's been blocked apparently because nobody can come in or out and they're directing their own traffic. So this was the first weekend you were telling? Correct, on the Sunday night. Uh, and it, again, has to be put in context. The reason I took this video was to share with my colleague at OPS, because that day we had been told that, you know, now we're gonna move towards egress, but I was trying to demonstrate there's no sign of egress at Coventry. And when you say, sorry, you said your, your colleague at OPS, you mean the kind of the police liaison? In the that person area? that was on the calls with us during, at those daily meetings, yes. Thank you. And can you describe uh, what yep. you saw in that video? Anything significant stand up to you? Um, well, two things. So this video, to put in context, is uh, next to the stadium. So on, you know, depending what map you're looking at, but not on the hotel side, but on the other side. Um, what I had observed during that weekend, and it, and it increased during the week and, and certainly in the second weekend was this sense of, of um, directing their own traffic, of allowing certain trucks in or you know, people in and not. Um, so there was a sense of security that was security system of some sort that was building up. I observed large scale tents that uh, again, from an event planner perspective, signified to me, you know, lots like organization and places to work and places to make food. I saw, um, I saw food being brought in. I saw deliveries being made. Oh, this is over the course of the four weeks. Um, and I saw that encampment grow from an overflow parking to an encampment a very solid, very organized, mm -hmm. uh, blues fest, large scale event style. We're here for a long time and we have the infrastructure to stay. Thank you. Uh, let's just play COM50743, please. Interesting. That's the same night, the other side of the parking lot. I don't know what the way out is. Here it is, packed side by side, kind of like this. Many people see full campers set up. Nobody's going anywhere. Again, so terribly embarrassing. Here to stay. Oh, sorry. So, um, so your understanding. Uh, Everybody based, hates their own voice, right? You know. Sorry, I just have to say that out loud. I'm nervous. So, okay. based on your observations that day. It sounds in the video, did you conclude that people were there to, to stay longer term? I am somebody that is very savvy with social media. To me personally, it was clear that the 70 kilometer train of trucks that crossed the country was not coming in for a small protest in a day. And to me, that Sunday night was the proof mm -hmm. that, you know, somebody somewhere had underestimated or not listened to the anger, frustration that a large, at that point, you know, large number of people felt. They were coming to the, the city of Ottawa as the representatives of what they thought, and they were going to stay there. They were going to stay there until they were hurt. I wanna just show one last video, COM50749. So when was this video taken? I believe that's the second weekend. Okay. Um, and uh, what you see in that video are things that, again, as an event planner, I took because it drove me crazy because there was a propane tank next to diesel with like wooden pallets packed right next to it, which no, I mean, an event would be a not even allowed to operate. Second would be shut down and police trucks would be there. Bylaw would be there. And as an event planner, I would be fined. Um, and there was no fining. I saw tents that normally, as a, again, as an event planner, both in my BIA role, but also per previously, you need permits to put up tents like that in the city of Ottawa. You pay a permit, an inspector has to come, there has to be a, an engineer evaluation. To my knowledge, none of that had been done at Coventry. So I essentially had a festival happening in my community that was neither sanctioned nor was it protected by the normal standards that the city of Ottawa would adhere to. And there's in the city, there's a thing called the SEEK program, which is Special Events Activation Team. And any event that goes 
through the city of Ottawa must go through this very, very stringent process of being evaluated by that. And none of it had been done. I, I witnessed downtown stages on the, you know, the, the back of a truck, uh, you know, wooden things made, uh, wooden things with diesel being poured onto them, like just things that were, in my 30 years experience, absolutely baffling and quite frankly, um, you know, dangerous. There's a few other videos I won't Sorry. take you to because of time, but uh, Miss Lee this morning testified that she saw urine in some of the streets. Yep. Did you ever witness anyone I, uh, dumping urine somewhere? Yeah, I have a video that I submitted when I was driving to see one of my staff and I was coming back towards on Nicholas between D&D &D and University of Ottawa. And I was taking the video to demonstrate that there was lawlessness. Like there were trucks parked on sides of roads and in the middle, like this is an on-ramp to a major highway. Um, and as I was driving past, I saw somebody out of their um, thing dump a, a chemical toilet and I caught it by accident. Um, onto, from what you, from, sorry, from what Right you outside D&D. Thank you. From what you observed, were the uh, participants in the convoy respecting the rules of the road at all times? I think some were, and I think a lot weren't. And what did you observe that led you to that conclusion? Um, there's another video that I submitted where at Coventry, there, um, I don't know this for a fact, but I deduced that there was sort of a shift change that would happen. There would be a, a series of trucks that would leave in the morning and some would come back and they would sort of do this convoy style, obviously, they're a convoy. So, um, but on several occasions, I would be trying to sort of leave that parking lot and there would be 50, 60, 100 trucks all in a row, not respecting traffic, um, not respecting traffic lights and sort of operating as a parade. But again, in the city of Ottawa, when you do a parade, you have to have police escort. There are certain laws. It's announced ahead of time what your, you know, your trajet, sorry, I don't know that word in English is. Right. Route, merci. And, um, you know, so again, these were things that would happen. I saw convoys of trucks, uh, sorry, like farm tractors driving down Vanier Parkway, which is not even a truck, a trucking route. You're not even allowed a truck on Vanier Parkway normally. Like none of our businesses could get a truck to drive down Vanier Parkway to come give them a delivery. And yet, you know, we were seeing these types of things. So I saw a lot of that. Thank you. Mr. McHale, um, can you describe generally the impact on the businesses in your BIA? Uh, yeah, generally for uh, Spark Street businesses, the uh, for the most part, especially after that Saturday, the first Saturday, uh, I would say about 85% of them just stayed closed uh, for the remainder of the protest uh, and for the week afterwards. Um, uh, it was difficult uh, for them. I mean, the businesses that were open would suddenly end up with 5, 10, 15 people in the store unmasked uh, wanting to use the bathroom or just to warm up, um, not actually getting any services, especially if it was a retail business. Um, uh, food business initially on that first weekend, uh, you know, reported to me, the staff would report to me that they had difficulty uh, managing uh, the customers coming in. Um, businesses were, of course, were under the regulations for the closure and such. So if they were allowed customers in, those customers had to be masked. There was limits on what they would do. Um, it was impossible for them to, infor uh, to enforce it. Um, and uh, that was something I think we did bring up on one of the calls eventually, which was, and then again, initially we were told, no, it's up to the business to enforce that. If the business has to make the decision whether they're gonna stay open or closed, it's up on the business. Um, and then we, it was you know, brought to their attention, it's, like, it's quite impossible for a single shop owner to police five or six people who are in, uh, determined not to follow the local health ordinances. Um, so we did get some clarity on that, that eventually that the, the uh, it would be in the um, uh, best judgment of the bylaw officer, whether or not uh, they would uh, impose a fine on the business or a warning. And are you aware of any businesses that received fines for? No, not, none of my me uh, members reported anything. It was said, though, sorry, I have to say, it was said that if fines were given out, they would be given out to the business, mm -hmm. not to the people. And so that's, again, another deterrent to keeping your business open, because if you can't control or have security there that at your own expense, which yeah. most of these stores didn't have at that point, again, we're coming off of a two-year um, you know, uh, COVID and, and, other, and then we all got caught off guard right before Christmas, they were shut down again. So a lot of these businesses had no money for security or anything. So they thought, well, if I can't police it, I'm going to get a fine and it's not worth it. Mm -hmm. So they would close.
Um, Mr. McHale, do businesses on Spark Street typically close during protests? No. Um, uh, when this started getting bigger than it was, or I was talking to my, my chair specifically about this, um, uh, he's been downtown as a business operator for over 50 years and has never closed his business. Um, and that would include during the G20 uh, summit when it was here a number of years ago and other activations. Um, it's never occurred to them to close during an, any event before. Uh, this was the first one time where um, uh, he felt a, a concern for his safety and, and, and any staff he were to bring in during that time, which led to uh, him closing his business. Thank you. Um, what other impacts, Mr. McHale, on uh, Ottawa businesses generally are you aware of as a result of the convoy? Uh, yeah, a business of mine uh, who uh, was publicly uh, against the convoy as it was interfering uh, with their business uh, um, had their Google review attacked. Uh, so they suddenly randomly started getting one-star reviews um, on their business. And that's something that's very difficult for a business to... Uh, it, it's an easy thing for someone to do if they're, they're ticked off, somebody's to give somebody a one-star review. But in this day and age, um, uh, of internet reviews and such, those things are so important to a business. Um, and suddenly a business that had a four and a half star rating uh, was suddenly trending, I believe at like two, two and a half, which is, um, there's no, there's, it's difficult to recover from anything like that. Mm -hmm. and it's very difficult to go to the providers, the Yelps and that and say, these are all fraudulent reviews. Um, uh, this is a bike shop owner. And so his business at that time of the year is very quiet anyways, but uh, he does have some customers coming in doing maintenance during the winter time and such. Um, and the intention was to be open for the, for the, for his mechanics to do work through the winter. Uh, and during this period, it was just impossible. Thank you. Those are all, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, it should also be noted that the Rideau Center in its history and in the history of Cadillac Fairview had never closed never. for every day. And even when the stores are closed, the Rideau Center is the walkthrough for transit. So it's always open 24 yeah. seven. You can go to the washroom there. You can go warm up in there. It closed and that cost them $2 million a day. And they were closed for you know, three, three weekends, uh, the worst of which would be Valentine's Day and, uh, can, and, and Family Day. And I think for businesses, we have to state how important that is. I have a business, Quelque Chose Patisserie. Uh, they have their bakery in Pats I'm sorry, I'm going quickly. Their, their bakery in Vanier. Um, they also have uh, two other franchises, now three. Um, but because, the and they had trouble at the Byward one, so they closed down, but that affected the bakery and it affected also Westboro because their Westboro location, people were told to stay home, so they didn't have it. So again, that is, that losing, for that bakery to lose, Valentine's Day and Family Day weekend carries them through the first quarter. The those two days, it, it was said to me yesterday by that business owner, that carries them through January, February, and March. And again, that's a normal January, February, March, not one where you were shut down at Christmas, not one where you've been shut down for two years. So it was devastating. Thank you very much. Those are all my questions. We're out of time, but I do want to allow you if there's anything that I haven't covered that you think we need to share with the commission uh, briefly. Cool. <laughs> No, you can go. I've been going first, so you can. <laughs> um, I just think it's difficult to explain. It's, it's been very difficult sometimes for us to explain how devastating it's been for the for our business community in the downtown core. Um, uh, you know, a prime example, I think, was an example. It was about halfway through the event. I'm, I'm in line that night about after spending 12 hours on the street. I'm in line at a coffee shop in, in Canada. Uh, just to pick up some coffee for the next morning for my family. And I'm looking inside this coffee shop and I'm seeing customers inside. And I immediately, my brain said, oh my God, they're in violation of the health orders. Da, 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 da. And then, then I realized, no, the rest of the province has been allowed to open. It's just downtown Ottawa. Uh, and mm -hmm. I think that's the effect that this had was because this activation happened for as long as it did, police directed staff, directed uh, the residents and visitors to not come downtown. Um, it's a something we still deal with uh, today um, um, with the Wellington closure and such and the reputation of the city and the downtown. We've, we've already seen it in tourism numbers this summer, they're down. Uh, we're continuing to see that the reputation of the city has been, um, as a place to visit, has been uh, greatly uh, tarnished. Uh, and it's gonna take us years to truly recover for that in the downtown core if we ever do. Thank you. I have two things I would add. One, just to say to that, I have friends who, you know, decided they would have this beautiful Ottawa staycation day this summer, and they go and they bike, you know, and they go to the market, and then they're sitting out in the market at the end of this really amazing day, and then all of a sudden, this protest comes up, and people start yelling and screaming, and 
And so this was months afterwards. So to Kevin's point, it's still happening now. There's still disruption to businesses. The second point I'd like to make in closing is that, and I, I don't know that this has been tackled, but Vanier is the most diverse uh, BIA of all the BIAs in Ottawa. And we have the highest level of racialized people within or racialized business owners. Um, so MacArthur specifically is a street which is the closest street to the convoy, um, a street that is very multicultural and has a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of specific cultural groceries, restaurants, those types of things. Anecdotally, there was, there was a lot of, um, it was very difficult for some of those business owners, and though they may or may not have closed, um, the sense, and I think, you know, the, the speakers this morning sort of talked to that, there was a sense of like foreboding in the city. There was this intense uh, feeling. Um, and specifically, one of our organizations that we worked quickly with was, uh, was targeted or targeted, was intimidated to a certain extent um, by having men standing outside their windows looking in. Uh, again, comments being made, and this is a shelter for Indigenous women and children. So, you know, it, it, it has to be said that, that um, the damage done, I think, was somewhat disproportionate to those in our city that are equity seeking and equity deserving, especially our small businesses. Thank you very much. Those are all my questions.